Yes, yes, yes. God is so good. And I thank God for each and every one of you as we uh, share with you the unsearchable riches of the gospel of our Lord and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, it is a privilege to be able to share with you uh, God's uh, richest blessings. Yes, God bless you. Appreciate you so much. Uh, trying to situate this here where you all can see it just a little bit better. Should have done this, all of this beforehand, but nevertheless, we're family. So uh, there we go. God bless. Hey, Brother Ryan Bill, God bless you, Brother McCowan. Thank you so much for being with us. Listen, I want you to tell somebody that we are uh, getting ready to study this pertinent subject matter. Uh, we're going page by page through the word of God to see are there modern day apostles? What are their qualifications? Does God still call people to that particular office? And if so, how can we know these particular individuals? And so I believe it's a, ble a lesson that is going to be a blessing to you. As I get ready to go into this, um, I want to share just a few things with you. First of all, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, that made your way to the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. Yes, AIM was a tremendous blessing for those of you that are watching uh, after the fact, we just got after out got out of the International Auxiliaries and Ministry Convention of the Church of God in Christ. And I think I'm going to scream and holler and have a conniption fit if I hear one other person say Ames, Ames. It is not the Ames Convention. It is the AIM Convention, Auxiliaries in Ministry. That's actually what it stands for, Auxiliaries in Ministry Convention. It's not the AIMS Convention, and it is not the uh, AIMS Department, but it is the AIM Convention comprised of five different departments of the Church of God in Christ. And we just had a glorious convention last week in Indianapolis. All of the conventions, actually AIM is a composite of three different conventions. Music and Youth, that's a convention in itself. Sunday School is a convention. And then, of course, our wing of the uh, uh, ministry, the Missions and Evangelism Convention, uh, and how God blessed in that convention. Missions led by Kojic World Missions President Bishop Vincent Matthews. And then, of course, myself uh, serving over the Department of Evangelism for the entire Church of God in Christ. And my counterpart, Dr. Dorinda Clark Cole, uh, I literally saw many people instantly baptized in the gift of the Holy Ghost, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. We experienced a miracle of a resurrection, literally, that occurred in the uh, service. A lady had went out, basically no breath, no pulse, nothing, uh, for almost 10 minutes or so. And uh, the saints stopped the service. Hallelujah. Glory to God and prayed. And uh, God restored and revived that individual. Uh, not only that, there were so many people in my department that experienced uh, sickness, having to go to the hospital and all got healed and touched every last one of them. And so he moved uh, in a great way in the AIM convention. I, I thank God and honor him and praise him for how he uh, blessed, how so many of you were with me on Wednesday during the official day of the Department of Evangelism. And the scripture that I ministered from was... Um, Amos 5, 21 through 24, the subject matter was God is not impressed. He's not impressed with all these conventions, conferences, convocations, and meetings if we don't actually change. You know, you can uh, go to the uh, Burger King or any type of hamburger restaurant, Steak and Shake, wherever, White Castle, and you can go into the uh, White Castle restaurant, high five people and thank God for White Castles, shout and dance around the store because of White Castles, preach because of White Castles, fall out. I mean, have a great time and leave out and never actually experience white castles. And so that's the same way with church when we come and celebrate Jesus, preach about Jesus, fall out about Jesus, run around in circles about Jesus, touch your neighbor about Jesus, but then leave out and never actually try to live like him. And so um, that's what that message was about. The scripture I came from was Amos 5, 21 through 24. And it reads powerful from the Message Bible. When you get a chance, read it from the Message Bible. And it is so profound. God says, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? He says, I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. And that's the message that's just been upon my uh, heart. People were sharing with me. Yeah, we've heard you preach before, but it really seemed like you had something in your spirit that you just had to uh, release from God. And uh, that definitely is the message that I'm taking 
across the country. You know, it's great to desire signs, wonders, and miracles, and and for God to work. But if we don't have compassion on the people that really need the miracles, if we don't have kindness towards our brothers and sisters, what good is it to have all of these um, religious functions and we're not actually changed and transformed? So it, it's not against conventions and conferences, obviously, because we have a convocation coming up that we want all of you to come to. God is the one that call, called conventions and conferences, Psalm 55. Gather my saints together with me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. But in our assembling, let's also have fairness and justice towards each other. Let's really live this life. Let's live righteously. Um, speaking of living righteously, there's a lot of controversy out there now in regard to uh, Leandria Johnson, one of the gospel singers who admittedly is probably one of the most talented uh, singers I have ever heard in my entire life. You know, it's something when somebody sings and it's something else when somebody just really has it. You know, we call it, it's, we call it sing. You know, they don't just sing, they sing. Um, and so she really has a lot of talent and there's a lot of controversy in regard to uh, some of the things that she has stated. Hey, President McCowan, uh, there's a lot of things that she has stated. Bless you, Brother Anderson. Um, there's a lot of things that people are, are saying in regard to a recent rant that she had where she's um, cussing like a sailor, calling people out and saying all kinds of things. I just want you to know, uh, Bishop Harmon, that this is new maybe to this generation. Um, and when I talk, a lot of times people say, well, you're only 46 and you sound like you're 70, 80 years old. Um, you must understand that I'm a young man, but I was brought up under the what they call the great generation. I'm a generation Xer, all right, the generation right before the uh, millennials. And um, the baby boomers is the generation that was born to the great generation. I was actually brought up by my grandparents, which were part of the great generation. So there's a lot of things that, you know, a lot of sayings and things like that that I picked up from them that, uh, even though I'm 46, it may sound like something from 90 years ago. I'll never forget when I uh, was fussing at my kids about going to the icebox and getting some uh, milk. And uh, they looked at me like I was crazy. I really got frustrated, started screaming at them. Did you hear what I said? I said, go to the icebox. And they looked at me, they looked at each other. They finally said, well, we don't even know what an icebox is. But that's an old statement. Um, but nevertheless, if you study the history of gospel music, there's always been characters in gospel music, you know, cussing like a sailor, fornicating. There's one lady that she was a um, alleged lesbian and they were like, you know, don't let any woman near this lady because she is just so notorious. And these are gospel singers way back when that you'd see with the praying hands and all looking all righteous and sanctified and everything like that. They had the look, but they didn't all have the goods. Uh, because just because you're talented, just because you can sing, it doesn't really mean that you're mature and you walk with God. It really doesn't even mean that you're saved. You know, there's some people that are not even professing salvation that can sing like crazy. They're just talented. And there's some people that are just great speakers. You know, that doesn't mean that they're saved just because they're a preacher. And that's what we mix up. We mix up the talent, the gift, the office with the um, person. And you really cannot do that because uh, just because you're a gifted speaker, it doesn't mean that you are righteous and sanctified. And so it used to be 40, 50 years ago, you could hide with those kind of double lifestyles. You can't do that in 2018. So it all just comes out. So pray for pray for that dear sister that God would um, not only get a hold of her, but pray for everyone that's in hiding that are uh, portraying to be sanctified, portraying to be saved, but really living a different type of life. Um, she just happened to get caught. There's a lot of people that just haven't got caught. That's what it is. And so um, we, we, we really need to stress that message of holiness and righteousness like never before. I've been criticized on these lives, basically stating that, oh, he's preaching his doctrine from his church and all of that. He's preaching his doctrine as a bishop in the Church of God in Christ. Really, when you study the historicity of the Church of God in Christ, bless you, President Hines. Thank you for your support. Um, bishop C.H. Mason, the founder of the Church of God in Christ, never really intended uh, for the church to be institutionalized as just an organization. It's a movement within the broader movement of holiness and Pentecostalism. And as such, the early saints of this movement did not believe that holiness was just a requirement for members of the Church of God in Christ. Holiness is an experience uh, for everyone that claims to be a believer. Um, to be sanctified means to be separated from sin and consecrated to God where you live a righteous life. That's what holiness actually is. And nowadays I hear people claim to be believers. I hear people claim to be Christians, you know, church members, all these different types of things. Rarely do you hear people now use the term saint. 
But the Bible says we are called to be saints, not just church members. We're called to be saints. So again, pray for our dear sister. Listen, just before we go to the word of God, because this is going to be a very interesting subject, I want you to share it with everyone, especially those that say that they're called to be an apostle, especially with those uh, that you know of that are apostles or have been consecrated to that particular office and where the regalia of the office of the apostle, I want them to uh, tune in. And we're going through the pages of the word. Actually, it's not electronic tonight. It's old fashioned, just going straight to the uh, scripture. So you want to get your Bible out and follow along. But this coming Friday, this coming Friday, July 13th, I'll be at the Roseview Church of God in Christ in a one night revival. The revival actually is three days. Uh, the Rogers brothers are preaching all week and I close out on Friday. Next Wednesday, those that can and will that join can, can join me if you're in the Southern California area. Uh, if you're in Phoenix, Arizona, I see somebody from Phoenix, Arizona. If you're in Las Vegas, I will be in Los Angeles, California at the West Angeles Church of God in Christ, where my presiding bishop and chief apostle is the senior pastor. So those of you that can and will join me, I'll be preaching for the opening night of the evangelism convention for the West Angeles Church of God in Christ next Wednesday night. Of course, that's going to be uh, aired on the internet, but I'd like to see you in faith. So if you live in, live in California, you know, San Diego, San Francisco, well, Hankerson, that's like a six hour drive. Hey, come on down and come and see us at the West Angeles Church. Next uh, Thursday, we'll be in our clergy coalition meeting. And then on the 20th, I'll be in Mobile, Alabama. But get ready, the saints are coming. The saints are coming. The saints are coming to the third annual Holy Convocation of the Missouri Midwest Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ. I ask that you would go to my page and please share the commercial that was just released today. Our convocation is the 22nd through the 27th of July. We start off on the 22nd Sunday night with Prayer Blaze, and then on Monday night is the free musical Prayer Blaze. It's going to be at Life Center. The musical is going to be at Kennerly Temple. Following that, Tuesday through Friday, all day services will be at Life Center. All evening services will be at Kennerly Temple. You don't want to miss it. Tuesday night, the Bishop Jerry W. Macklin, second assistant presiding bishop of Kojic, will be preaching. Wednesday night, Bishop Todd Hall. Thursday night, Dr. Dorinda Clark Cole. Friday night, the one and only Bishop Paul S. Morton. Do you know people are coming from all across the country, as far away as the state of Washington, Texas, Indiana, and people are even coming from throughout the country. We have delegation coming from the nation of Nigeria and other places. This is literally a great conclave of the people of God from all across the world. So you want to come and join us. You can register right now at mmej.org. Come on, I need, need at least 20 of you to register right now as a part of this great convocation, and I want you to join us. If you desire housing, you can call the number 314-303-4536. That's it. Stomp, Brother Kenner. Well, don't let me stomp too heavy because I'll knock the camera down. 314-303-4536 Three, is the number to call if you desire housing for the convocation. That's it, July 22nd through the 27th. We're going to have church just like we did in Indiana. President Kenner, he is on the line, and uh, we had a great time again in AIM, and we're looking forward to a great time. We came back. Of course, I got cussed out in cat language when I got back. Our cat, do you know that? Our family cat. Yes, Mr. Grinch, Mr. Grinch, the kids call him the bishop. You know, the bishop backslid. We thought our cat was saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost in his own way. But I tell you, when we got back, he had plenty of food, plenty of water, plenty of toys and everything. And he's normally pretty independent-minded. But when we got back, he went from person to person. And I hate to interpret whatever it was that he was telling us, but he really got all of the family told. Went from first person, yow, yow, screaming at everybody, just having a fit and letting us know that he was so upset about us being at the AIM convention. For So pray for Kitty. Kitty's been a bad kitty, bad kitty cat. And we're praying that he would um, get himself right. He's doing a little bit better now, but just the other day, looked like he lost every ounce of um whatever nurturing that he had, looked like he lost it. Well, let's pray and go into the word of God. Father, bless our time together and we'll thank you and give you the honor. Uh, we thank you for ease of delivery and we thank you for not only revelation knowledge, which comes from your word, but also understanding in the body of Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Listen, are there modern day apostles? Are there really people that are called to the office of apostle in 2018. Well, first of all, let's understand what an apostle was. 
in New Testament times. Of course, we're in New Testament times now. And for those of you that are looking at the camera and you see me looking up and looking down, don't think I'm looking off into the sky. I'm actually looking into two camera lenses, and that's why I do that. So uh, <laughs> just in case it looks like I'm, I'm looking off into the wind somewhere. But um, the word apostle comes from the uh, Greek word apostolos, which actually was a secular term. And really an apostle in the secular sense was just somebody that you uh, sent to represent you. You sent on a special mission. Um, for example, you know, say it was modern times and it's times back when, but the closest thing that I can think of is, you know, say you're, um, you know, the boss or CEO of a company and you want to diet Pepsi with cherry in it. And so you uh, send a, a special representative to go and to uh, get you that Pepsi with the cherry and to come back. That's your representative. They're going on your behalf, representing you. They're getting what you need and they're bringing it back. That's one example. Or perhaps uh, you're a CEO and you can't make it to two or three different events. And so you have another individual that you send as your representative. I do that many times as a bishop. I cannot make it to every single meeting, even though I try. There's people that ask me, I don't know how you do it, Hankerson. Well, it's nothing but the grace of God. I'll tell you that because once this convocation is done, I'm going to disappear someplace where there's some blue water and some palm trees and some ocean and there will not be any phone answering or even any lives or anything like that uh, going on. But uh, many times what I have to do is have to send people to represent me in the clergy coalition. I have two vice presidents and they represent me um, in the Department of Evangelism. I have seven uh, staff that are vice presidents and I have five uh, senior vice presidents in the uh, jurisdiction, there's uh, about five or six administrative assistants, uh, a couple of pastoral assistants in my local church. And so all of these are my representatives. So basically, if there's something that comes up where I cannot make it, uh, I send them and they represent me. And that's really what an apostle actually was, was simply just a representative of someone in a higher office. It was not something spooky. It was not something with lights, camera, and action. It was simply a special representative. And so when Jesus uh, called his apostles, these were, these were literally special messengers that were to represent him. Let's look at Luke chapter 6 and uh, probably the 12th and the 13th verse. It says, and it came to pass in those days that he went up into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. And of them, he chose 12 whom he named apostles. Many times we get the uh, term disciple mixed up with apostle and we say, well, Jesus only had 12 disciples. Jesus had way more than 12 disciples. He had the 12. Uh, when you go to Luke chapter 10, he had about 70 people uh, that were also special ambassadors of his. Uh, it depends on the translation that you read because some translation will say it's 72 and others will say that it was uh, 70. And these special ambassadors really had a lot of the same spiritual powers that apostles had, but they were not considered uh, the 12. Then, of course, he had, you know, thousands of others that followed after him. Of course, by the time he left, there was only a handful of people really uh, that stuck with him till the end. And then when you go to the um, New Testament in Acts chapter 1, it was only 120 that <laughs> followed his command to uh, go to the upper room to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's amazing of Brother Anderson, because when you look at it, um, you, you wonder who, who was it in that upper room besides, you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the 12, you know, well, 11, um, and then uh, Matthias and a few others that are named, but you don't really have the names of all of those individuals. I, I tend to wonder, you know, what happened to the woman with the issue of blood? What happened to blind Bartimaeus? What happened to uh, the man from Decapolis? You know, what happened to all of these different individuals that were at Peter's house, where from sun up to sun down, all these people got healed. These were tons of people. What about the 5,000 that experienced the miraculous uh, uh, feed of, of, of bread and fish? And then another occasion where there was 4,000 that experienced that. You wonder, what happened to all these different people? Well, there's only really a few. Uh, he had a mega ministry. Jesus had a mega ministry. But when it came to total obedience, it was really just a storefront, you know, when you consider the fact that 120 out of all these people uh, followed all the way as far as his commandments were concerned. 
But Jesus nevertheless had tons of disciples. A disciple is a student or a, a someone that learns from another. Matthew 28 says to go and to make disciples of every nation. Don't just go and get people saved, but go and make disciples, make people that are going to imitate Christ, make people that are going to learn how Christ is. And again, it goes back to my message and aim, and it goes back to what God has really recently laid upon my heart. We teach people how to do everything. We teach people how to praise, how to worship, how to give, how to be successful, how to have faith, how to work miracles, and all of this is important. But what about teaching people to be like Jesus? You know, not just in the sense of his power, but also in his character. And so um, out, of the tw out of the number of people that Jesus had, it says he chose 12. This 12 was a special group. So actually, uh, think about it um, when you, you look, and I'll get some questions a little bit later. I have people asking me questions. I appreciate that, and thank you so much. Be sure to ask that a little bit later, in about the next uh, 30 minutes. I'll, I'll answer that question when I come to the end of the uh, lesson. But there is no one that's in that category of the 12. There is no one that is in that category of the 12. When you read Acts chapter 1, verses 21 through 22, you'll see the uh, qualifications of being one of the 12. And everyone, even people that were in the New Testament that were considered apostles, were not a part of the 12. Paul was not a part of the 12. Now, there's some arguments that people will say, well, he should have been included uh, in the 12, but nevertheless, he was not. Jesus chose 12. In Luke chapter 6, verse 13, Revelation calls him the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And they are in a category all by themselves. And some of you have read books. There's a book in some of his teaching can kind of get way off track. Uh, he's dead and gone now. But the late uh, Kenneth Hagin uh, actually wrote a book on the fivefold ministry. And he mentions about the 12 apostles of the Lamb, that they are definitely in a category by themselves. Now, again, you got to read what he has with a grain of salt because everything he states is um, not necessarily uh, uh, sound or orthodox, but uh, so a lot of the things that he says actually is. Kenneth Hagin was basically the father of what you would call the word of faith uh, movement, and some of it is good, but you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones. But no one else, let me make this plain, no one else can be in the same category as the 12, not in the sense that they were superhuman because none of these apostles were superhuman, no one that's calling themselves an apostle nowadays is superhuman. I'm not superhuman and neither is anybody else. It's not by might or by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. So the Lord anoints us. We are, we are spirit and we dwell in a house of flesh, a house of clay, a house of flesh and bone and blood and organs and all of that. But nevertheless, we are not superhuman. We are not superhuman. What we are is we are humans that God has created and then God uses us for his glory. So the 12 are not special in the sense like they walked around with a halo over their head all the time. Uh, they made mistakes. They, uh, Peter uh, talked too much at times. Not only did he talk too much in the book of Galatians, Paul had to call. The reason I keep sweating, it's hot, you all, here in uh, St. Louis. It's probably close to 100 degrees. So in spite of air conditioning and everything like that, that's why you'll see me. And I got my anointed water, too. I've got blessed water. You know, soda wouldn't work today, so I've got blessed water. This is blessed ice mountain water. Um, but, but Peter had different issues. Paul had issues. You talk about, uh, I mean, just look, do a character study and really look at the apostles just in the sense of um, how they talked, um, how they communicated. Um, those were everyday people. And some of them were probably people that you may not want to hang around. I, I couldn't see myself really uh, getting along with Paul too much because I can be considered, Lord have mercy, the bishop is on the line. Bishop Gilkey is on here, and I'm about to talk about myself. Uh, plug your ears, Bishop Gilkey. Uh, but, but I'm somewhat of a, well, not somewhat. I'm a very stubborn individual, very opinionated. And, um, you know, uh, being stubborn, when you look at Paul and, and his pushiness and, you know, what he wanted, he wanted now. Um, he was somewhat braggadocious. You know, my, my particular personality wouldn't really get along with someone like that. As a matter of fact, I believe it was Paul and Barnabas that ended up splitting over John Mark. They got into such a big argument that Paul said, I'm going this way. Barnabas said, I'm going that way. That lets you know these are Holy Ghost filled people. And in order for them to maintain their sanity and their sanctification, they had to go in separate directions. 
And uh, that's important to realize no matter how anointed you are, no matter what title you have, you are still human and you need the power of the Holy Ghost. You need the power of God in order to lead God and direct you, because if you don't do that, you know, no one will be able to stand you or be able to uh, be around you. And that's literally what happened with Paul and Barnabas. I remember a time early in my pastorate, I've been pastoring around uh, I think we're going on 25 years now, not here, all here in St. Louis, uh, but 25 years pastoral ministry all together. I pastored for many years in another city, Springfield, Missouri, a uh, great ministry down there, and then moved to St. Louis. But I remember the early days in my pastorate in Springfield, as well as in St. Louis, saints would fall out with each other, and I'd try to bring them to a room and, hey, let's get together, let's hash this out. Well, after the first fight almost occurred, I said, you know what, we better change that because, you know, you can try to make people come together, but it takes God in order to uh, have people to have unity and true oneness and true accord. So again, don't think that because God calls you to be an apostle or you have a particular title that you are superhuman. Those apostles, those original 12, these ones that Jesus set aside as his 12 apostles, were not superhuman. These were individuals that were human, that God used. They had flaws, they had character flaws. Uh, they needed to come up higher in different areas of their life, but nevertheless, God used them in spite of them. And even when we look at our own life, God uses us in spite of us. We don't deserve God's goodness. We don't deserve all the things that God does for us, but nevertheless, he uses us for his glory. You know, we live for him all we know how to live. We strive all we know how to strive. We strive for perfection. We we, we strive for uh, being everything God wants us to be. But there's times that you strive and you're like, goodness, I, you know, I messed that up. You know, I had the wrong attitude, had the wrong thought. You know, I didn't have the wrong, right thought about this individual. You know, they ticked me off and because they ticked me off, I was just ready to just act silly and, and, and act stupid. Uh, uh, um, and really come out of character. And so we, we have flaws in different areas, but God uses us in spite of it all. So realize this, dear hearts, a title is not going to make you more anointed. A title is not going to make you more what God desires for you to be. That takes a life of consecration, prayer, and Bible study really having a devotion with God. It's important that those of you that are preachers that are watching, that you have a prayer life, that you have a prayer life, not just a study life, but a prayer life, an actual prayer life where you talk to God on a regular basis. Qualifications of an apostle, one of, of, of these original 12, is found in Acts chapter 1, 21 and 22. It says, wherefore these men have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, one must be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So you see right there, Paul definitely was an apostle called of God, but Paul did not meet those qualifications and neither do any of us in 2018. In 2018, no one can say that they went out and among Jesus for those three and a half years of ministry. They weren't, you know, none of us were there at the beginning of the baptism of John. None of us were there when he was taken up in the ascension, and none of us were a witness, an actual witness physically of his resurrection. Those were the qualifications for that special group of 12, and there is no one in 2018 that meets those qualifications, so no one can say that they are an apostle in that particular sense, that they are one of the 12. Jesus had the 12, and that was it. Of course, Matthias was ended up uh, getting... Um, voted in, you could say, elected in as one of the uh, 12. And later on in Revelation, it talks about the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So obviously the church, the body of Christ, received him as one of those 12. And he took the place of Judas. And again, that's the whole case in itself when you talk about an election or really casting lots is what they did. Um, you can say that they casted lots and it was divinely orchestrated, but nevertheless, um, that really was an election because they gave the qualifications that people had to meet. And uh, when they put that out, there was only a couple people that met those actual qualifications to even qualify to be one of the 12. But that's close. And so people may say, well, that's not fair. It's not fair. In the kingdom, it's not about fairness. It's about the sovereignty of God. And that's what we must understand when people talk about kingdom, kingdom. We must be kingdom minded and kingdom. There is no such thing as fair. It's whatever the king says, whatever the king says, that's it. And so if the king of kings 
has chosen 12 to be those special messengers, that's it. You can't add to it and say that's not fair. We should add somebody else and, you know, Black Lives Matter and all of that. No, it doesn't black, white, red, yellow, protest all you want to. He chose 12 and that's it. So the qualifications were given. Now, the Bible talks about false apostles, those that say that they are apostles and are not. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. And I would tend to say that there are many people in 2018 that are really false apostles. They're saying that they have the title or they're saying that they have the office, but they actually do not. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, and it's important that you read this entire book because in this book, Paul is actually defending his apostolic ministry. He says here in 2 Corinthians 11, let's start at verse 12, but what do I do? That will I do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, wherein they glory, they may be found even as we, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. So that lets you know right there, if a person is deceitful, if a person is walking in darkness, if a person is bringing glory to themselves, that's just from those two verses, those are not apostles. You cannot bring glory to yourself and be an apostle. So don't, you know, try to go out and get somebody to have a consecration service for you. You start wearing the scarlet garments and all of a sudden now, look at me, look at who I am, I'm the apostle. Paul says here, people that glory in themselves, people that are deceitful, people that walk in darkness, people that have not been transformed by the power of God, those are not true apostles. To be a true apostle, you should have been transformed by the power of God, walking in light, walking in righteousness, not deceiving people, not manipulating people, not bringing credit and glory and adulation and worship and adoration to yourself, but bringing glory to God. An apostle is a special messenger. So if an apostle is a special messenger, the glory doesn't go on the message messenger. The glory goes on the one that sent the message. And the message points back to the one that sent the message. So everything that a special messenger does should bring glory to God. It should bring glory to him. Anytime there's more uh, 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 attention on yourself or on your ministry or on your accomplishments. Now, I know somebody can um, criticize us in the church for that and say, well, Hankerson, I hear what you're saying, but then when we come into your church settings, you're giving honor to 20 or 30 different people before you ever get to the scriptures. And not only that, you give more honor a lot of times to people than you do to God. Well, the scripture does talk about giving honor to whom honor is due. And it is true that maybe we do go overboard with that. I listened to um, the video, or not the video recording, but the uh, audio recording of the late Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, founder of the Church of God in Christ. He didn't do a lot of protocol. If you listen at one recording, he said to Pastor Four and all the ministers here and to every listener, and boom, goes right into what he has to uh, talk about. So yeah, perhaps we really just need to change the um, uh, culture. We go a lot of times overboard, and one way that we go overboard, admittedly, is you have to go through all the protocol to present someone, to present someone, to present someone, and everyone that presents someone, to present someone, to present someone, goes through the whole line of uh, protocol. You know, so those are some things we need to change. And that's why, really, I try to go through it as quickly as possible, because you are supposed to honor leaders. You are supposed to honor each other. You are supposed to uh, encourage your workers. You know, sometimes people just need a word of encouragement, but you don't want it to go overboard to the point that you say, you know, let's praise Jesus. You know, when we give a little complimentary hand clap. Well, let's praise uh, uh, this this particular person. Ah! You know, everybody's rejoicing and magnifying God because of a person. We're nothing but flesh and blood. And the scripture says no flesh is the glory in his presence. So, and so we'll take that. That's something that we need to change. We need to adjust and we need to do better on. But false apostles, false apostles are one. Read it when you get a chance. Second Corinthians 11, read verses 12 through 15. They bring credit to themselves. They're not trying to bring credit to God. They, uh, uh, um, or have not been transformed. They're not walking in light. And even according to the book of Revelation, chapter two, verse two, uh, the church is to try those, to judge those that say that they are apostles. Revelation chapter two, verse two, it says, I know thy works. This is talking to the church at Ephesus, thy labor and thy patience, and that thou, thou, how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, 
And so I shared with you from 2 Corinthians what makes a false apostle, but also Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 tells you what a false apostle is. is someone that's evil. is someone that's a liar. So if you're an evil liar that has not been transformed and you're bringing credit and glory to yourself and not credit and glory to God, then you are not a true apostle. And listen, 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 let, let, let me say this, church, and I wish you all would share this with as many people as you possibly can, because I'm about to say some things that really the body of Christ needs to hear. The body of Christ, we've allowed ourselves to be dumbed down by a misinterpretation of the scripture, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. Um, listen, I want you to understand this. When it talks about the prophet, you know, uh, uh, do my prophet no harm, touch not my anointed, that's talking about the people of God. It was literally talking about how the Israelites, as they were moving from Egypt into the promised land, no one was to bring them harm. No one was to uh, come against God's people. And if they did, there was going to be dire consequences. So touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm does not mean a preacher can do everything he or she is grown enough to do, and there's nothing you can say about them. You better not touch me because I'm God's anointed. Hold on, hold on. Don't allow these false prophets, and that's what I'm calling, because a lot of these people that are saying they're prophets, they're not, you know, because I don't care how much you call yourself a prophet, you, you don't have the authority over this book. And this book, the word of God, has been given to every believer. So don't allow anyone to scare you. You know, the God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but he's given you power and love and a sound mind. Don't be under some ministry or allow somebody to put some curse on you. I'm an apostle of God. I'm a prophet of God and I'll curse you. Yeah, yeah you try to curse me, it'll come back on you because you're going to reap what you sow. I'm blessed of God, according to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And you cannot, you cannot curse what God has blessed. The scripture is literally talking about the people of God. And listen, church. God has put gifts in the body of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 12, according to Romans 12 and other places. And do you know prophecy is supposed to be tried? Tongues and interpretation is supposed to be tried. And yes, even apostles, according to Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, Jesus commends the church at Ephesus. Now, later on, he says, you've left your first love. But he commends them, he says, because you have tried them, which say that they are apostles and they're not and you found them to be liars. Jesus didn't say anything and rebuke the church here talking about, you shouldn't have touched my anointed. Those are my apostles and you shouldn't have touched. No, he says, you tried them. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to try something, you know, try it and see whether this is of God or not. Again, don't allow people to dumb you down like that and intimidate you and make you think that they can do everything they're big and bad and grown enough to do, and you better not say something, because if you say something, you're going to be cursed, because I'm God's anointed. First of all, everybody's not anointed. Some people are manipulators. Some people know how to move a crowd. Some people are good with words. Some people study people. They read people. I've watched some of these folks. They'll come into different settings, and they're watching everybody. They look, you know, just like a wolf, looking for the weakest link that they can find, looking for the weakest person, looking for someone that's going through, looking for someone that's gullible. Then once they get that person that's gullible and, and, and gets a reaction out of them, it stirs up other people. And really, it's a familiar spirit. It's a spirit of manipulation as what it actually is. And so, yes, there are true apostles in this day and time, few and far between, but we are to try those that say that they are apostles. You know, don't just take somebody's word for it. Um, what, what, so how do you know there's an apostle? Well, Acts chapter 5, verse 12, and 2 Corinthians 12 and 12. Let's look at Acts chapter 5, verse 12, and see what, you know, how you're going to know who is an apostle and who is not. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 gives you one example. It says, and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. That's two signs right there. Through apostles, there's going to be miracles. There's going to be signs, and there's going to be wonders. Now, you got to be careful with that because Thessalonians talks about signs and lying wonders. So you can't just look at miracles, okay? But when you read on in the text, it says, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. A true apostle is going to be concerned about the unity of the body of Christ because in the Lord's prayer, which is found in John 17, which is different from the model prayer found in Matthew chapter six, the Lord's prayer, Jesus' high priestly prayer is found in John chapter 17, 
where he prays for his disciples. He prays for us and he prays for the body that the body would be one. Father, make them one even as I am in you, that they all may be one. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Jesus' ultimate concern in his prayer for the church in John chapter 17, you say, well, church wasn't started at that time, but he, he prayed for everyone that was going to believe after the apostles' time, and that includes the church. So that was a prayer for the church. In that particular prayer, you know, you always have critics. In that particular prayer, Jesus doesn't pray for us to prosper. He doesn't pray even for us to have miraculous power. He doesn't pray for us to be blessed. Um, he doesn't pray for us to be the head and not the tail. His ultimate concern in John 17 is that the body would be unified. And so if a person is a representative of Christ, a special representative, because that's what an apostle is. If a person is a special messenger, hear me out, uh, church. If a person is a special messenger of Christ, they're going to be concerned about what concerns him. And what concerned him was unity in the body. So watch someone that rises up and says, I'm an apostle. I don't answer to nobody. I'm not accountable to nobody but God. I bash this denomination. I bash that organization. I talk down about that man of God. I talk down about that woman of God. Follow me because I am God's true messenger for this day and for this time. That lets you know right there, that person is just lying through their teeth. They are not a real apostle, They're not a real apostle. They may be talented. They may be a person that has a lot of influence, but they are not a real apostle because a real apostle is going to be concerned about unifying the believers unifying the saints. The scripture says not only did the apostles work signs and wonders, but there was unity. There was unity among the believers. Read Acts chapter two. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. After the apostles, glory to God. And all of those individuals received the gift of the Holy Ghost. It talks about how no one was in need amongst them and they had everything in common. They sat at the apostles feet and heard the teaching and went from house to house and ate their bread in, with gladness and simplicity of heart. You didn't hear anybody talking about, oh, I'm the great. The only, you know, Jesus rebuked them that time when uh, 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 they, they began to try to pull off who's going to be the greatest, who's going to be the top one. Jesus said, you're not the Lord it over each other. And I'm going to read that scripture in a minute. But you are all brothers. You are all uh, family. And so you don't lord it over each other like the Gentiles do, like you're some kind of slave master. So anytime you find someone that talks like they're a slave master and they do nothing but cause controversy in the body of Christ and division in the body of Christ and they're against everybody in the body of Christ. Because first of all, you're not the only one that's saved. God has somebody else that's saved. God has somebody else that is a Christian. God has somebody else that's following him. So never think that I'm the only one that's really hearing from God. This is a true church. I'm, I'm the only one that's got the truth. Someone that's talking like that, run for the hills because that is not of God. All right, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Again, where Paul is, when you, when you get a chance, you're going to read all the 2 Corinthians 12 because through that entire book, Paul is uh, literally defending his apostolic ministry and things that maybe he didn't intend to talk about. They stirred him up so much and made the man so mad that he started sharing a whole lot of good information. I told you Paul was not a perfect individual by no stretch of the imagination. Paul said, listen, I wasn't going to brag, but you all have pushed me to this. And, and since you pushed me to this, let me say all of these things. And there's even some passages where Paul says, like in 1 Corinthians, this is not the Lord talking, this is me talking. And so it's important to understand, again, these were cracked pots. These were human vessels that God has filled with his power and God has filled with his glory. And so don't look at an apostle as somebody fearful like they're God, you know, like they're the ones that we're to worship. That's how come you had people like Father Divine and Sweet Daddy Grace and all that back in the uh, day that people mistakenly thought, oh, these people are so great that they're God him, himself. No one is God himself. No one is God incarnate except Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In the 12th verse, Paul talks about the signs of an apostle. He says, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Watch this in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And again, the common factor there is the signs, wonders, and miracles, but you need to read the whole 
passage because where we just read in Acts, it was talking about unity. And then when we read here in 2 Corinthians, it's talking about patience or perseverance. Why is it talking about patience or perseverance? Because Paul, in this particular passage, talks about all the different things that he had to go through as a result of his ministry. Matter of fact, in the same passage, he said, I asked God three times, to take this thing away from me, but I found out that his grace is sufficient. Um, realize this, when a person is called apostolic ministry, there is going to be tremendous suffering, tremendous suffering for the sake of the gospel. I'm not talking about you didn't get the offering that you were looking for. I'm not talking about that they picked you up in a pinto instead of a limousine. I'm not talking about the fact that a certain television network didn't let you on their network uh, for you to preach. I'm talking about literal persecution, uh, literally having to stand for the sake of the gospel and possibly losing your life. When you read about the 12, John was the only one that, uh, according to tradition, died a natural death. Paul, you know, tradition says that he lost his head. Peter, crucified. That's what tradition says about these apostles and many of the early leaders of the church, all right? So the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so anytime you talk about a foundational ministry, there's going to be tremendous suffering that goes along with it. Why is that? Because you are paving new territory. You're paving new ground. You're setting a new, you're not following the trend. You're actually setting the trend. You're laying a foundation. Now, again, for people that say that they're apostles and they're laying a foundation, no one else can lay a foundation other than the foundation which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. However, there are those that may be called to go into certain areas and to start new works where Christianity or uh, full, the full, fullness of the gospel has not heretofore uh, been prevalent in that particular area. And there are people that God has used down through the years to pioneer certain areas for the sake of the kingdom of God. And there's much suffering that goes along with it. Late Bishop C.H. Mason, founder of the Church of God in Christ, was jailed on many occasions simply for preaching the gospel. Uh, one thing was the war was going on and uh, he was talking in tongues and in talking in tongues, um, especially, you know, in, 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 in original holiness, um, the saints were taught to be pacifists. You know, you, you don't fight anybody. You don't take up arms. You don't carry guns. You don't carry weapons. You don't try to kill anybody. You don't try to take no one's life. So you had the saints teaching that, and then you had the saints speaking in tongues, and then you had the saints, you know, of different races worshiping together, which was something that you did not do in the segregated South at that time. So because of that, the late Bishop Charles Harrison Mason uh, was followed constantly by the FBI. Now, you've heard about how Dr. King was followed by the FBI. You've heard about how uh, Malcolm X was followed by the FBI. But Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, founder of the Church of God in Christ, was also followed by the FBI. I was recently preaching in Washington, D.C. I didn't have time to go there, but they stated to me that you can go actually to uh, the government building and see those files on the late Bishop Charles Harrison Mason. Now we know that there's some controversy and some things that they found as far as Dr. King, which I won't go into. Um, they also uh, followed after Malcolm X and they followed after um, Charles Harrison Mason. Here's the difference with Charles Harrison Mason. He was a holiness, sanctified preacher, which would pray for many, many hours, consecrating himself to God. And at one time, uh, there was, uh, you know, that's a good question. I want you to ask that again a little later. Someone is asking me, does Kojic recognize apostles, prophets, prophetess? When you go to our manual, you'll see that those offices are recognized in the Church of God in Christ. Uh, matter of fact, it's in our original manual under the C.H. Mason uh, era, and it's in the manual now. If you go to your black book now, it talks about those different offices of, of ministry uh, in the Church of God in Christ. Great question. I thought I'd just answer that right now since it's pertaining to what I'm uh, dealing with. But when they came for uh, Bishop Mason, they said, we want to talk to um, Mr. Charles Harrison Mason. They said, oh, he's praying right now. Came back an hour later. They said, he's praying right now. <laughs> came back two hours later. He's still praying. Three hours later, he's, Bishop Mason would pray nine hours at a time, you know, straight, nonstop, you know, just a consecrated individual. And so um, it's amazing to see how that was uh, done against him. One time they, they threw a brick and hit him. Um, and scarred the side of his face. Uh, he would preach. They would throw rotten eggs into the place. 
uh, where he was preaching at. Uh, he was shot at numerous times. Um, one reason why there was such a battle at that time, and it's not so much now, but you may remember a time there was almost a downright hatred battle between the Church of God and Christ and the Baptist Church. And, and one reason why is because C.H. Mason had been voted out of the Baptist Association because of his teaching of sanctification as a second work of grace. He ministered in the office of an apostle and in, in, in laying the foundation for that. And it was something new, of course, to people. And so he was persecuted uh, heavily for it. And so he went into one particular place, this was down in Mississippi, and told the preacher, he said, no, the preacher was going with the choir director and all that kind of stuff. And the deacons were going with different people. And he said, no, come out of your sins. Come out from among them. Stop your shacking. Stop your fornicating. Stop your adultery. And they literally tried to kill him. They literally came after him with guns. Because imagine, you know, you're doing all this sin in the dark and somebody exposes you and comes out with it. And all of a sudden now, you know, people find, what? Not Reverend so-and-so. And so, so I mean, it was a Ooh, it was a big mess, they say. And I've got, um, there's some uh, church members from West Angeles that are related to these people that can tell you the story from way back when, when that occurred. And so apostles will deal with persecution. Apostles are not just going to walk in in, in, a, in a class A, you know, with your red shamir and all of that and all these different kinds of regalia that you wear and uh, everybody's bowing down and worshiping. You know, there's going to be some persecution that you're going to have to endure if you actually flow in that office. Another thing is this, if you say that you're an apostle, according to 1 Corinthians 9 and 1, then you need to have seen Jesus. First, I already got quiet here because that puts out a whole lot of people right there. 1 Corinthians chapter, what did Hankerson say? You have to have seen Jesus, and Hankerson didn't say it. The Bible says it, 1 Corinthians, and the reason why you're hearing pages is because normally my um, uh, lessons are electronic, it's just old fashioned, today, old fashioned Bible straight from the, uh, in, I don't know some of you said, that's the most raggediest Bible. Hey, thank the Lord for it. Um, good Bible, too. 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 says this. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So an apostle should have seen Jesus and have some kind of work to show for it. Paul said the Corinthian church or churches, as some scholars believe, it was more than one church in one location in multiple locations, actually, is where it was. Um, basically, he says, that's that's the qualification that makes me an apostle. I've seen Jesus. He saw Jesus by revelation, according to the book of Galatians. And so there are those that will have seen Jesus even in 2018, either by vision or by revelation. So yes, the Lord will make himself known in that particular manner. Of course, the original 12 saw Jesus face to face. They were there with him from the baptism of John up until his ascension. And those that are called to the office after that dispensation, they will have seen Christ also. But nevertheless, it will either be by vision or it will be by revelation because Paul was not there during that particular time. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was not interested in nothing Jesus was doing. They don't have nothing to do with that. You don't hear about Paul during those particular times until after the time of the ascension. And he says here also there's work to prove it. So just because you have a title, you know. It, it, you, you don't even have a church and you're an apostle. You're not even pastor in a church and you're apostle and you don't have nothing to show for it. Um, now, maybe the calling is on your life, but what I would say is let the work speak for you. The song says, let the works that I've done speak for me. I can speak to, to you all as an example with that. I was actually flowing in the uh, uh, office of a bishop before I was ever consecrated to be a bishop. And the national church even recognized that and said, we're simply recognizing what God is already doing in this man's life. And so if you do have that, then really there should be some sign to show forth that you are an apostle and that you are a prophet or whatever it is that you are. Well, I won't say whatever you're calling yourself to be, but that's what some people are actually doing is just calling themselves to be something because they feel that that's something that is important. I don't hear a lot of people saying, you know, I'm called to be a servant. You know, God has called me to be a, ooh, I'm called to the office of servant. I get to serve people. I get to serve God. I get to, I get to serve the underprivileged. I get to feed the hungry. I get to clothe the naked. I get to go to hospitals. I get to go to jail. I don't really hear a lot of people getting excited about that. I don't see people 
bragging about that on, on social media. Hey, you all, I got to go to the hospital today and visit some people that were dying of cancer and pray for them. I got to go to the orphanage and minister to the fatherless. I got to minister to some widows today and let them know it's going to be all right and that God's going to take care of them. And I was able to bring them a care package. You know, you don't hear people saying that too often because we want to be important. Flesh wants to be on parade. Flesh loves accolades. Flesh loves to be patted on the back. And I'm not talking about encouragement because sometimes you must encourage yourself, but flesh loves all of those accolades. We've got to get our priorities straight and our priorities right. Paul says, I've got work. I've got labor to show that I have truly been called to this office. Now, are there apostles now? Yes. Ephesians chapter four. So in no way am I saying that there are not apostles and that God does not call people to apostles because the scripture says this, that you are going to have apostles until we all come together. Ephesians chapter four, verse 11. And he gave some apostles. Now that's, I can preach on that right there. Some prophets, you know, I've walked in some, some churches where everybody is a prophet. Everybody's not a prophet. Okay. Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So this lets us know what the fivefold, we call it the fivefold ministry. Some actually call it fourfold because in the original language it's uh, that the Bible was written in or that the epistle to the church of Ephesus is written in, it uh, says apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor slash teacher. So pastor teacher is almost one office in itself. Uh, but but really, there are some that are called to the office of teacher that may not necessarily be pastors. How long are you going to need these offices? They're going you're going to need them to edify the body, to build it up, and you're going to need them till we all come to the unity of the faith. So that lets you know right there: as much division as in the body of Christ, as much division as within religious organizations, as much division as within local churches, as much division as there is among preachers, we need the office of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And what is the apostle to do? To help bring the unity of the faith, to help bring the knowledge of the Son of God, to help bring the church to perfection so that we can reach the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, to mature us so that we're no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine and, and, and by the slate and cunning craftiness by which people deceive. We're gonna need the apostle to help us to speak the truth in love that we may grow up in all things unto the head, which is Christ, and from whom the whole body fitly joined together, verse 16, by that which every joint supplies. So in other words, every part of the body is in place doing what it's supposed to do for the effectual working of the measure of every part, make it the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So the apostle is not given to fatten his pocket. The apostle is not given to be rich and famous and to drive around in Rolls Royce. There's nothing against Rolls Royce, but um, you know, People, if you don't watch it, we need to go back to basics. And I preached this a few weeks ago in our local church. Go back to basics. Go back to the Ten Commandments. Go back to the Golden Rule. One of the first things in the Ten Commandments it says is you are to not have any other gods before me. We brush that off because we don't have Baal and Asherah and Chemosh and Molech and all these different gods nowadays. But think about the preachers that we have put up on pedestals. Think about the celebrities that we have put up on pedestals. And because we put them on such a pedestal, we put the attention and focus on them instead of God. And we wonder why there's so many scandals in the body of Christ. The reason why there's so many scandals is a lot of people are not real prophets and not real apostles. Because a real prophet and apostle is going to encourage the body of Christ to reach maturity, to encourage the body of Christ not to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Read the New Testament, all right? After the book of Acts, you're dealing with most of the epistles. A lot of people don't like dealing with the epistles because they're spiritual. They like dealing with a lot of the stories in the Old Testament because, you know, there's a lot of carnality and things like that. that are there. There's a lot of stories. And Jesus even said, I'm talking to you in stories because you can't comprehend spiritual things. Oh, my goodness going off into, into some deep waters right now. But he says, that's why I have to talk to you in parables. That's why I have to break this down this way in parables, because things that are spiritual, you're not getting it. All right. So the epistles, you're dealing with spiritual things. You're dealing with doctrine. What is it that nowadays people don't want to hear messages and teachings on doctrine. Teach me something feel good. Get, just give me a word of encouragement. Just give me a word of inspiration. Just inspire me. Just let me know it's going to be okay. 
you know, be a motivational speaker that will just give me a shot of inspiration that I can make it from week to week. But when you get into the epistles, the epistles are really talking about you maturing, you acting right, you straightening up your, your, your bad attitude, you straightening up your behavior, you learning to be honest and quit being crooked and quit being a shyster. That's what the epistles talk about. You know, uh, and, and, and to the point that Jude had to say, I was going to write to you about the common salvation, but it was necessary and needful for me to tell you to contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. Read most of the epistles, possibly with the exception of the book of Ephesians. And most of those epistles are dealing with doctrinal errors. And when you look at the apostles, though, that's what their concern was. When you hear the heart of Paul, when you hear the heart of Peter, when you hear the heart of John, they're talking about character, being ready for when Christ comes. They weren't talking about, listen, I'm the great chief apostle, you know, so send me a thousand dollar vow because I need to get me a brand new airplane. Oh, I didn't say it. Yes, I did say it. Um, send me a, you know, this so I can uh, brand, buy me a brand new car because my car is worn out. You don't hear that kind of carnality. So to the body of Christ, I exhort you, you know, it's time to toughen up. It's time to become scripturally knowledgeable it's time to try those that say that they're one thing and they are not god has given the body of christ that kind of power there is power in the few and the saints of god need to realize that you know god gives leadership not for the body to worship leadership god gives leadership because he loves his people we are his people and the sheep of his pasture and so that's what god is concerned about he says woe to these shepherds that fatten themselves instead of tending to the flock. In spite of everything I have to do as a leader in the body of Christ, I'm a bishop, I am a national officer in my organization, I'm a, a community leader in, over the clergy coalition, but I'm also a pastor. And my members will tell you, now, and of course, they love to see me a whole lot more than they see me, but they will tell you, if you get into a need and into a bind, you call him uh, two o'clock in the morning, whatever, if he's in town, he is running, gonna make sure he makes it to that hospital. You know, if you've lost a loved one, he's going to make sure he, he, he sees about you because you're to tend to the people of God. And even when my family was younger, all of us, we I dragged Lady Hankerson and the kids running up to hospitals and things like that. You know, going it now, I don't do it as much as I used to because there's people that took advantage of that. I would show up at a wake for somebody, you know, a member of the church is your loved one. And I'm showing up at the wake and the funeral. You're not even there. And I'm calling you to see what's going on. Oh, I had to work today. I'm sorry. I'm at your loved one's funeral that I don't even know. And you didn't make it. You know, those kind of things, you know. So there's abuses that take place. But the, the, the believers or the leaders are to have concern for the people, concern for the souls. Pastor, how much time do you spend telling God about your people, telling God, you know, and, and praying to him, asking him to bless the people, open up doors for the people? I, I want to admonish every pastor right now to just begin to intercede. I'm not right now, but I mean to begin to intercede for the people that God has set you over to serve like never before. And I believe that God will work in a, in a great way. As I close in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, here is the real characteristic that God wants us as leaders to have. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, it says, but Jesus called them unto him and said, ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Too many people trying to be great and trying to be grand. You're not all that in a bag of chips and a chocolate chip cookie and a pickle on the side and a scoop of vanilla ice cream with a cherry on top. Yeah, we're, we're something in our salvation, but as far as in our self-importance, we're not all of that, okay? But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, let him be your servant. Isn't that something? How, how would we like to have the title minister? You know, I ain't no minister, I'm, a, I'm an apostle. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bishop, I'm a superintendent, I'm this and I'm that. He says, you're, you're to be a minister. A minister is a servant. In the early days of Pentecostalism, Bishop Mason, W.J. Seymour, and many of those early leaders, C.P. Jones, they didn't even refer to each other as Reverend. It was simply brother. Here's Brother Mason that's here to speak tonight. Brother Seymour is here to speak tonight. I almost think that we need to go back to that in the body of Christ because some people will get offended. If you don't call him administrative assistant, if you don't call him suffragan bishop, if you don't call him the diocesan, if you don't call him that, you know, they're gonna be bent out of shape and lose their inertia in the entire service. 
you know, so you don't want them to lose their inheritance. So what you got to do is, uh, is to acknowledge all of their different titles. All right. 27, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Um, as I close, that's one of the reasons why last week in the city of Indianapolis, Indiana, um, the Department of Evangelism, we had the team to go to the Wheeler Mission. And at the Wheeler Mission, we were able to serve the um, uh, residents, that's what we'll call them there, at the Wheeler Mission. Yes, I actually had um, uh, um, put on an apron. I haven't, I haven't had one of those plastic aprons on since I did kitchen duty in elementary school. And some of you may have saw the picture I had the a uh, little thing that you put on your head. Everybody's looked fine, but for some reason, mine looked like Chef Boyardee. Uh, it didn't look right. But nevertheless, um, I took the uh, brothers and sisters there from evangelism, and we began to serve the people. And after we were done, I shared with them. I said, let me tell you why I did this. The reason why I did this was to show you by example that we are to serve. We're not here to serve ourselves. Evangelism is not about uh, prestige and honor and preaching engagements, but it's about serving God and serving people. And one of the individuals said, I've never seen a bishop do anything like this before, going around serving plates to people and things like that. I did that to be an example. Listen, Jesus did it to be an example to us. Jesus wasn't washing feet 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And even the apostles said, we're not going to leave the ministry of the word of God to serve tables. But every now and then, preacher, it's good to serve some tables. It's good to wash some feet so that you can be an example to the people of what this is about and so that you can keep your own head on the ground as well. You don't want to get the big head. But listen, I want to uh, answer some questions as I close. You can read the scriptures um, on your own time. Acts 14 and 14 talks about Barnabas and Paul being apostles. Romans 16 and 7 talks about Andrew and Nicus and Junia being apostles. Some people actually say that Junia was a lady. Some translations say Junia, some say Junia. So there's some controversy there. So there were tons of people that had the office of apostle in the New Testament that were not a part of the 12. The 12 was a special group all in itself. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll take some questions. There was uh, someone there on uh, Periscope. You had a wonderful question earlier. And uh, I did answer a question that uh, was presented. Um, I hear this scripture a lot. I, uh, I did answer a question that was presented in regard to the Church of God in Christ. Does the Church of God in Christ recognize the ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers? <clears throat> uh, yes, officially, because when you look in the official manual of the church, those offices are mentioned. I say yes, officially, because every local congregation is led by a pastor. And you may have a pastor of a church that says, I don't care what the manual says, I don't recognize that. So nevertheless, uh, you may have, I, I know in the church that I came up in, and it's obvious that I came from that background, uh, elect lady Melanie Brown, we, we were kind of skeptical. We were kind of, because we had, we had seen some everything come through there. You know, one preacher came through, oh, the Lord is showing me that somebody has a headache. Well, you know, you had five or 600 people there. There's gonna be at least one or two people that has a headache. We're like, you, you gotta come with something more than just that. So there's so many people trying to be wonders um, that we were somewhat skeptical. And I guess you could say I'm somewhat like that now. You know, as a leader, you have to really, and I, I do recognize that God calls people to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all of that. But again, I've shared with you from the scriptures what those qualifications are. Do I know some people that flow in that office? Oh, yes, I know a few people that actually flow in that office. But let, let me tell you this, if I could be dead honest with you, the people really flowing in those offices, they're really not concerned about the title. They're not really concerned whether you call them that or not. They're just doing the work. And there's a lot of people that um, have the title and they're not necessarily doing anything. They're not doing the work. So that's how I would answer that. Is that my missions president just joined in? Bishop Vincent Matthews, all the way from Memphis, Tennessee, by way of South Africa. God bless your heart, sir. It's so good to see you uh, with us. And I don't know, this seems kind of slow. So it looks like some of you are answering things that I talked about maybe 20 years ago, not 20. 20 years ago, you can tell I'm tired, 20, uh, 20 minutes ago. So nevertheless, uh, thank you so much, Bishop Matthews, for turning, tuning in. I thank God for all the leaders that tune in from time to time. But again, I will say this in answer to that question, um, a person that really is an apostle or really is a prophet, 
Um, they're not so much concerned about you recognizing them as that because they know what God has anointed you to um, do, uh, anointed them to do. And so they have nothing to prove. They're not trying to prove anything to anybody. They just flow in that office. Another thing I will say in answer to that, just because a person pastors a large church, that doesn't make them an apostle. There are some people that have a strong gift of administration. And because they have a strong gift of administration, they're able to build a large ministry of five and 10 and 15,000 people. But that does not necessarily mean that that individual is an apostle. Again, an apostle is a special representative of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's going to be signs and wonders. There's going to be uh, concern really in general for the body of Christ and not just for their own particular movement. So that's why I say, again, watch people that come on the scene that say that they're an apostle and they cause so much division and controversy in the body of Christ. Listen, Paul was controversial, but Paul sought to bring unity in the body. And he talked about unity as, as bold as Paul was. Read what he says in the text. Look at Ephesians, how he talks about tearing down that middle wall of partition and making one of Jews and Gentiles. You know, read what he says in Ephesians chapter four, even one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in all. Read what Paul says in Romans, how he uh, uh, condemns the Jews, he condemns the Gentiles. And then finally, he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so that was a bold message that he was preaching because the Jews, you know, took that as an insult. You know, the, the, the oracles of God have been given to us. And what you mean that you pray for Israel, that we might be saved? We're already saved. We were saved for you ever got here, you know. And so anyways, um, yeah, that's right. I see somebody's texting me now. People doing their job and not concerned about their time. Just do your job. That's a good hashtag right now. Just do your job. Just do the work. Paul did the work, and in spite of how controversial he was to many people, Paul was concerned about unity in the body of Christ. So a real apostle is going to be concerned about the unification of the body of Christ, not the division of the body of Christ, not trying to tear up the body of Christ. A real apostle is not going to, on purpose, tear up a local church terrorize other preachers and terrorize other ministries and terrorize the body of Christ. Watch this, uh, uh, believers, because, again, I mentioned two people, and you can uh, read up on them when you get a chance. <clears throat> there was Sweet Daddy Grace, who was the founder of the United House of Prayer, um, which actually at one time he was considering being a part of Church of God in Christ with the late Bishop Mason, and there was uh, Father Divine. These were leaders that uh, people veered off, and as the people veered off, they eventually really started to worship these individuals. And even if you don't watch it, even in the Church of God in Christ, admittedly, there were some people that really got off track and almost got to the point of almost worshiping Bishop Mason. And Bishop Mason never intended for nobody to worship him or make a god out of him. And I heard somebody say one time, oh, he was so close to the Lord, he was almost Lord on earth. And I wanted to scream out, blasphemy, blasphemy, because there's, there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Jesus is his name. And so um, when you look at a lot of those leaders from back when, black people were so oppressed. Black people had went through so much in society that they were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a savior. They were looking for someone to bring us hope, someone that can make a difference. You know, a, a Elijah Muhammad, a sweet daddy Grace, a, a father divine, a, a, a C.H. Mason or whoever else, you know, somebody that could bring us out of you know, these Jim Crow laws, you know, somebody that could bring us out of this segregated uh, uh, South. And so as a result, some people really got things misconstrued and started to worship just about some of these individuals. Now we look on that and we, we, we look at it facetiously and say, shame on them. They were worshiping a man. But what happens when there's people that do the same thing in 2018? You know, uh, unless you hear from a certain preacher on social media or a certain preacher prophesies over you, uh, you know, you don't feel like you've heard from God and nothing is moving until so-and-so and so comes to town. That's idol worship is what that is. God is the only one that gets to credit, the praise, the honor, and the glory. He is the one that we're to lift up. And if there's a real apostle, a real apostle is going to lift up Jesus Christ. Now, let me say this also. 
a lot of the imperialism that has been a part of the church of church, church of Christ, a lot of the imperialism that's been a part of the body of Christ for maybe the last, um, I would say, 1,700 years, that is not how Jesus set his church up to be. Um, I read to you from Matthew 20, 25 through 28, where Jesus talked about serving. And so the apostles at the time of Christ were really just anointed everyday individuals that God used to represent him and to build the kingdom of God. But what happened when Christianity went from being a, a, a legal religion to being the official religion of the empire, all of the regalia of the empire infiltrated the church. And that's where you got almost where the man of God is a king and everybody is to bow down and worship. And like I'm telling you, we, we, we are kings and priests in the kingdom of God in the sense that all believers are kings and priests before God. But we're not all of that, that, you know, there's some preachers that, 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 that you just take it to the extreme. You know, someone has to wash your car. Someone has to iron your clothes. Someone has to take your clothes to the cleaner. Someone has to shine your shoes. Someone has to go to the bathroom with you. Someone has to uh, uh, take your kids to the daycare. Someone has to clean your house and all that kind of stuff. And I understand <clears throat> if we're busy, because all of us are busy, all of us are busy, and there's some things where you can have some people to help you out and assist you in different areas where your time is freed up because time is more valuable than money. We understand that. But when it gets to the point that, oh, you are so anointed that you can't gut, cut grass, you are so anointed that you can't wash dishes, you are so anointed that you can't pump gas in your car, you know, then you get to the point where you're not really living in reality. And we're to serve the people, not sell ourselves up. You know, uh, Paul and all of the different apostles, <clears throat> even Jesus himself, the Bible says the common people heard him gladly. And so it's important that we don't have these aspirations. Uh, and then we go out and have somebody have a consecration service and make us an apostle. And I think now they say that three people, three apostles or three bishops can come in and uh, make you an apostle and make you a bishop. You know, you, 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 you want more respect than that. You, you want God to do it. You want God to use your life. Don't make a mockery of your ministry like that because the people will laugh at you. Now, they're going to smile in your face. They're going to show up at your service. That's one thing about church folks. We're going to show up at your service. We're going to dance now. We're going to dance. We're going to dance at your service. We're going to show up at your service. We're going to hear you preach. We're going to cheer you on. We're going to put money in your um, offering and everything like that. We're going to talk about you. When I say we, no, not my, myself. I don't include myself in that. But that's what church people are going to do. Church people are going to talk about you. You know, do you know what he did? Do you know what she did? Do you know what they're calling themselves now? And you don't want to make a mockery of your ministry. You want people to respect you and to respect the things that God is doing in your life. So allow God to do it. Allow God to exalt you. And then you can really bring glory to his name. Listen, my time is up. I'm getting ready to get out of here. Believe it or not, Tuesday night's a Bible study at Life Center. Getting ready to go teach Bible study after all this teaching. And you're welcome to come and join us. Um, Listen, let me tell you something, and I'm going to say this to this young man. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. You keep coming on here, and I want you to know that I'm going to call your pastor because you're out of order. You keep coming on here being an internet bully, and I have your name, and I know who your pastor is. I just saw him the other day. Don't come on this live stating your opinions, and you don't have scripture. If you don't have scripture, then you don't get on this live. And I'm trying not to have you blocked because I'm trying to have this where people can come in and join, but you come in and do this all the time. And I want you to know that you're out of order because I've given you scripture and all you're stating is just your opinion. If you want to deal with me, then you deal with me by uh, scripture, not by your opinion. But once I get done with this, I'm going to have a talk with your pastor like I did before too, because you're out of order. The Bible talks about let all things be done decently and in order. And uh, you are definitely out of order. And I rebuke that in Jesus name. I rebuke you and I rebuke that spirit. And you're not going to come on here bringing that confusion like that. Definitely, if you don't have scripture, you're just coming on just to uh, uh, state your opinion. Give scripture with what you say, and we can discuss and we can talk. But just for you to get on here causing a mockery, just for you to get on here uh, being an internet bully, you met the wrong person, okay? And I will be talking to your pastor. I do have his number, and I will be talking to him and sharing with him about your behavior, how you are. Uh, on here causing confusion and not bringing the word of God. So continue to shake your head because you're out of order. All right, saints of God, as I close this, I want you to join us um, 
in the Holy Convocation for Missouri Midwest Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction. And how can you do it? How can you rebuke a person and then go right back to announcement? Listen, if you're a parent, you can do it. How many parents have ever had to correct your kids and do this and do that, the other, then go back, get on the telephone, run to the bank, and you know, you got to know how to multitask and do different things. But um, don't forget to join us July the 22nd through the 27th. As I was asking earlier, I want at least 20 of you to go and register right now at mmej.org, mmej.org. We are expecting a mighty move of God that's going to take place at the third annual Holy Convocation of the Missouri Midwest Ecclesiastical Jurisdiction of the Church of God in Christ. Day services will take place at the Life Center Church, which is 8500 Halls Ferry, and the evening services will take place at the Kennerly Temple Church of God in Christ, where the Bishop, uh, Lord, I started to say Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, where the Bishop uh, R.J. Ward, the Bishop Robert James Ward, is our, you can tell I'm in, in between aim and convocation, about to call the man Bishop Mason. But anyways, Bishop Ward is the pastor of Kennerly Temple. That's at 4307 Kennerly Avenue. We start off with prayer at six o'clock on Sunday night, the 22nd of July. And that's gonna be at Life Center Superintendent Gerald Pace, who's probably one of the most anointed prayer warriors I have ever met. Uh, that man can pray and within, 10 minutes is like the glory of God is there. People are getting healed and delivered and filled with the Holy Ghost and transformation is just taking place. It's just amazing to, to see. And what you're going to see on that night is tons of young people in prayer. It's going to be amazing. A lot of young people are our prayer leaders on that night. God is going to meet us in a great way. Monday night is the pre-musical, the 23rd. That's going to be at Kennerly Temple at seven o'clock. DeWard Davis from California is our special guest. And there's many others. Uh, uh, president Michael Lampkin is our music president. And also uh, Sister Amber Elliott is our vice president of the music department. The musical is always a tremendous opening to the convocation. But we actually start off with prayer, prayer and fasting, seeking the face of God. And that is on Sunday night. 23rd, of course, is the musical. That's Monday night. Day sessions don't start until Tuesday. Tuesday through Friday, we start off with prayer at 930 our institute at 10 o'clock, and then our morning service is at 11 o'clock. You can go to my page and go to the Missouri uh, Midwest page and see more about our wonderful speakers that we have at the 11 o'clock service. That's always an anointed time because you have people that have taken off their jobs and come from out of town to be in these services. And a lot of times I'm coming and going, and when I come in, I'm in places just rocking and shaking because God is moving in such a great way. The night services begin um, Tuesday night through Friday night. Tuesday is going to be water baptism night. On that night, um, tons of people are going to be baptized in water. Bishop Jerry W. Macklin, the second assistant presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ, is going to be the speaker on that particular night. Uh, it is going to be an awesome service. You know, when, he, when Bishop Macklin starts doing that number, you know, you know it's on there. You know, he's feeling the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And so I've seen him minister up under such a power anointing where people are healed, delivered, and set free. So I believe a lot of miracles are going to take place in this convocation. Wednesday night is going to be a massive youth rally. During that youth rally, here's what I want you to do. Will you all help me? I need 1,000 young people on that Wednesday night. What we want to do is pray for young people that don't have parents that have you know, many of us were, were brought up in church. We had someone to lay hands on us. We had someone to pray for us. We had someone to anoint us with oil. But we want to actually go into the community and get the young people that have not come up in church. And we want to be able to pray over those young people. We want to minister to families that have lost loved ones to violence. We're going to be uh, encouraging those families on that particular night. And we're just going to be covering this, gen hallelujah, covering this generation with the blood of Jesus. So please help us to do that. Now, these young people come in, you know, um, they may smell like weed, whatever. You know, we want them to be there because they're not necessarily coming from a church background. So our youth department and our evangelism department and some of our community leaders are helping us to bring those young people uh, to the convention on that night, to the convocation that night, so that they can receive prayer. Bishop Todd Hall is the speaker on that night. It is going to be great. Thursday night is women's night. Dr. Dorinda Clark Cole, I mean, that ministered 
uh, oh, it was just awesome. You know, the Lord worked on Wednesday as I ministered from, I'm kind of like an old school holiness preacher. The Lord blessed on that day. Bishop Vincent Matthews is a cutting edge technological preacher that just blessed us on thir Thursday in AIM. But on Friday of AIM, Dr. Cole, she just went into another stratosphere in the spirit and God used her. And so she's going to minister on that Thursday night, which is women's night. And then on Friday night, official night, uh, Bishop Paul S. Morton, one of my favorite uh, preachers and singers. I want to hear him sing, Lord, whatever you do, don't do it without me. I want to hear him sing that. And, and, and definitely, your ladder shall be greater. My God, hallelujah. And open the floodgates of heaven. So I, you know, I already got my own, you know, it's official night. So I, I have my uh, request that I want the uh, man of God to sing and minister on that night. It all takes place the 22nd through the 27th of July. People are coming from Washington State, Texas, Indiana, Illinois, uh, the nation of Nigeria, just from all over the place. And I'm asking that each and every one of you will be a part of this great convocation. You can go to mmej.org, find out more information. And uh, bless you, Brother McDaniel. He says, I'm an endangered species. <laughs> but um, I, I, I want you to come and be a part of these services. Come from far and near. Our host hotel is the St. Louis Airport Marriott. You can call or text right now, 314-303-4536 for housing. That's 314-303-4536. It will amaze you to know what the hotel rate actually is. It will shock you to know what the hotel rate actually is. Call right now or text right now, and you can get that special rate, 314-303-4536. I need each and every one of you to share the commercial that was released today. Be sure to share it everywhere so that people can come and be blessed by the power of God. We start off all of these different services with prayer. It is my intention to meet the Lord in prayer on time with the saints. I've already alerted my pastors just like our first year. I don't want to be in the office with no meetings and things like that. I want to be in the service with the saints in prayer. So they're trying to do everything they can to make sure all of the business is handled ahead of time so I don't have to be in the office dealing with uh, all these different situations. If you are a uh, bishop or an apostle, as we talked about tonight, uh, Friday night you'll be in class A, uh, class A, uh, or, or choir dress as it is known, okay? And our adjutancy will help you with that. Listen, uh, my time is up, but this coming Friday I'm going to be at the Roseview Church of God in Christ here in St. Louis, 11982 Roseview Lane, One Night Revival. Next week, next Wednesday night, the 20th or the 18th, rather, I will be in ministry at the West Angeles Church of God in Christ, where Bishop Charles Everett Blake is the senior pastor and our chief apostle. I would like to make mention that also during that time of ministry, we will be going to the men's shelter with Elder Bullock, and we will be ministering at the men's shelter there in Los Angeles, California. I'm excited about that because that's. You, you know you're really anointed when you go someplace and preach and you know you're not going to get an offering. That, that's what lets you know that you really have something. And so we're going just to minister and to just share the love of Christ, to even help serve meals and all of that. Um, and that's what our ministry is all about. Here, here at Life Center, on this night, when you drive up on Tuesdays, you're going to see tons of people lined up uh, outside the church because we have one of the strongest uh, feeding ministries in the city of St. Louis Missouri. And so you want to be uh, a part of that time of ministry in Los Angeles. Those that can and will make it. Next Thursday at 11 o'clock is our clergy coalition meeting for the city of St. Louis. There's more information coming out about that. I want all the clergy to meet me. Thank you so much for being a part of the uh, press conference. And then on the 20th, I will be in Mobile, Alabama, ministering for Bishop Gardner, I believe it is, and his convocation. Follow my page and you can have more information. Until next time, I thank God for each and every one of you, and we will see you next time. Be sure to share this video uh, with those that feel like they have a call to the ministry of apostleship, and uh, we believe that they will be blessed. Let me shut off my uh, uh, Periscope audience. God bless you, Periscope. Appreciate you so much. Thank you for tuning in, and now we're going to end our Facebook uh, uh, message. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Appreciate you. And until next time, every time I turn around, the Lord is blessing me. God bless.